ดีท่านแขกผู้มีเกียรติทุกทุกท่านนะคะขอต้อนรับทุกท่านค่ะได้เข้าสู่ Sustainability Expo 2023นะคะ Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, I'd like to welcome all of you to our Sustainability Expo 2023 in the session of SXX Sha Time with s i c h a Ethnic Communities in Safeguarding Cultural and Natural Heritage. Now, our main objective of Sustainability Expo 2023 is to raise public awareness on the importance of sustainable development across all sectors of the society, and in partnership with the Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance or s i c h a this collaborative episode of Cha Time will explore low local wisdom, knowledge, skills, and experiences from ethnic communities in ASEAN and the Asia Pacific, namely Aka. The Mon and Maoli contribute to protecting their cultural and natural heritage to address the impact of socio-economic and climate change on their communities. Lessons in the genius efforts to maintain their cultural identity, preserve the biodiversity, and build climate resilience will be discussed. So let me invite our panelists on the stage. First, please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Mataya Kipa, Maori cultural expert from New Zealand. Next, please welcome Mr. Ayu Jupa, founder Aka Ama Coffee Thailand. Next, Mr. Chak k i y o k the m o n artist from Malaysia. And please welcome our moderator, Miss Momo Rin. The Vice Chairperson, Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage. The stage is yours. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to SXX Short Time with Sicha panel discussion program. I am Momo Luen from Myanmar. Today, I represent the Siam Society and the Raya Patronage in Sicha Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance, and I'm honored to moderate this special session. I would like to thank C ASEAN and Essex for inviting C c h e r and the Siam Society to be a part of this event. Let me first introduce about C c h e r We are the digital-based uh, network of eight civil society organizations based in ASEAN countries who are engaged in heritage, cultural heritage conservation work. Established in 2019 with the mission to Promote effective cultural heritage management, and um, promote uh, effective government-community partnership in cultural heritage management. Strengthen the ASEAN social cultural community as a people-centered that pillar of ASEAN, and serve as a networking forum for member organizations. Chat time with Sicha is uh, our regular program, one of our regular uh, activities. The monthly program for uh, sharing knowledge and expertise on common cultural heritage issues in relation to climate change challenges in Southeast Asian countries. Talks are normally held virtually on uh, Saturday afternoon via Zoom, and live stream in Sicha Facebook page. And later broadcasted in s i c h a YouTube channel. This is the third year. We have a different theme for each year, and this year's theme is cooling the earth with uh, culture wisdom. Today we are presenting c h a r Time with s i c h a number 26 in partnership with as uh, fourth annual Sustainability Expo 2023, which is uh, Essex 2023. And today's program will last about uh, one and a half hour, including the Q&A session at the end of the panel. 
It is my great pleasure to moderate this session with these three outstanding cultural practitioners and advocates in the region whose efforts for the safeguarding cultural and natural heritage uh, together with their communities in the past decade has been quite remarkable. I'm very honored. And we have here Mataya Kepa, respected figure in the Maori culture and language, and Mr. Ayu Chupa, also known as um, Lee, uh, founder of Aka Ama Coffee, and Mr. Shak Koyok, a Tamwan artist. Mr. Mataya Kepa works to challenge established perception of Maori culture and encourage a deeper appreciation of the indigenous wisdom. Currently, he is engaged in the research projects that revive and normalize uh, Maori traditions while addressing the complexities of the modern world. And Lee has established uh, Akaama Coffee in 2010 uh, social as a social enterprise to support coffee farmers in Mejantai village, Meswai in Shanghai. Uh, Akama Coffee received many prestigious awards for its quality, taste, and ethnic, ethical production that he supports local communities to grow local uh, seeds. And Mr. Shaha Koyok, also known as Shah Koyok, is a, a contemporary artist of the indigenous Tamwan tribe of Selangor, Malaysia. Many of his work reflects the early trauma of encroachment on the jungle around his village by land developers. This personal history has fueled his passion to fight for the land rights of his people. Today our speaker's topic is ethnic, ethnic uh, communities in safeguarding cultural and natural heritage. This will highlight the role of ethnic communities and their cultural wisdom in uh, challenging against climate change, modernization, safeguarding natural environment and biodiversity towards achieving overall sustainability, which is the, the this event is all about. Um, let us start with Matthias' presentation. Could you uh, please tell us the challenges you face in the, um, with, with, with your work? Uh, kia ora. Uh, given that we are here uh, to speak about heritage and culture, I think it's uh, appropriate that I use my heritage and my culture to introduce myself. Ko ngongo taha te maunga, ko te rotorua nui a kahumatama moe te moana, ko te arawa te waka, ko te arawa te iwi, ko ngāti whakau e te hapū, uh, ko mātai a kepa tōku ingoa. My mountain is ngongo taha, my waterways are known as rotorua, my ancestors traversed the great ocean on a canoe or a vessel called Te Arawa, which eventually became the name of my people. And I introduced myself last, for those who were here before me. In this space of uh, heritage and culture, uh, it is customary that I also acknowledge the mountains of this region, of this land, the people of this land, uh, those who have organised such an auspicious occasion. Uh, kun in Tāpāna, uh, thank you all very much for uh, inviting me here to speak uh, to the audience today about the challenges that me and my people face in New Zealand. As I acknowledge you, I'd like to also acknowledge my panellists uh, who are here to represent them and their people and to shed some light on... Uh, the challenges that they face uh, wherever they are in the world. Uh, I am Māori. Translated, uh, we are the natives, the pure uh, and the natural people of New Zealand or Aotearoa. But traditionally we were known from our tribal heritage or our tribal genealogies. So I am Te Arawa, I am Ngāti Maniapoto, and I'm Ngāti Rārua. But from a national perspective or even an international perspective, people know me as Māori, and Māori are the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. The, the, the challenges that we face as Māori is how to be Māori and how to be proud of that. Why? Because society teaches us 
to think less of ourselves. Society has forced me and my people to have to adhere to a world, to a democracy that we are, we are foreign to. Our understanding of world compared to that of the colonizer are totally different. So in 1840, we had a treaty signed between the Maori and the colonizers of that time. And right up until 2023, we're still trying to fight for our rights and for what was promised in their documentation. So the challenges that I face are things like this in my country of having a secondary school that lives and adheres by a Māori worldview. Te whare kura o aro whenua that was vandalised. They were told that we are synonymous with uh, unfavourable things. Again, the other image says, we live in New Zealand, not Aotearoa. Stop ramming the Māori language down our throats. This is a daily occurrence. So it, there comes a time in a man's life, in a, in a person's life, where they start to believe the outside noise. And the challenge here is to re-empower our Māori kids, to teach them that their understanding of self is validated, is valuable. So some of the challenges are trying to empower Māori to be Māori and to be proud of it. Thank you, Mataya. And um, it's the same question to Lee on, on your, your, your journey to establish that uh, social enterprise and uh, what are the challenges for the communities. Thank you, Momo. Also, Mateo, your story is really, you know, touch me and also uh, very similar challenges that we are facing here in Thailand. Um, I was born and raised in a very small village outside Chiang Rai province under um, Aka indigenous family. And uh, at that time, I was born in a stateless family. And still, there are many stateless people out there in my community. So I believe that the difference of the people, not just one people, but this will be peoples behind of the indigenous community, I facing many challenges, but today one of the challenges that I would like to mention here and then probably will be very strongly effective of us here in this room here is about the indigenous seed and food system. Our food system is dominated by many, um, a big corporate company that's looking for the only capital to to wash and eliminate the indigenous seed away from our hometown. And our kids, our people start to eat only a few ingredients in uh, our community. So I'm not here to, to talk only about, about the rights or the basic infrastructure that we have to assess equally as everyone here, but I also Seems that the food system is broken as many uh, companies try to colonize the indigenous seeds that we have. And uh, I think this is the, to do something with um, also the rights of the indigenous, indigenous people to access to um, uh, education, equality of infrastructure that um, our country have to provide for for everyone, so uh, I think beside the rights of every ethnic and indigenous peoples, I think that the biggest challenge that right now the young people have to face is the cost for uh, lack of um, diversity, and uh, that will will cause a big problem. Not just the capital co problems that we have to pay but healthcare and uh, the dominated by many like modified species in our homeland. I think this is very, very scary. Thank you, uh, Lee. And uh, yeah, maybe I will sum up later. Uh, and this time is Shak Koyok 
and uh, what would you share us about the challenges to protect your communities as well as the natural biodiversity? In Malaysia, um, the, uh, the indigenous people, uh, my people, we uh, many of our uh, ancestral land or customary land been uh, uh, stole from us, uh, and then uh, they use uh, they I mean the government itself um, didn't uh, recognize our customary land by doing by that so they can uh, sell those land to the big corporation, especially in because many of our indigenous land are still um, a virgin forest, virgin jungle, and this is, this is our ancestral land. But they don't recognize that our, as our ancestral land because there's nothing there, there's nothing built there. They say, this, uh, how, you, how you prove that this is your ancestral land? That for us, that is very insulting because we know uh, in that, uh, it's called wild jungle or wild, From the wild jungle, they contain a lot of story, a lot of cultures. Even our ancestor was buried there. In our religion, in my religion, I'm a Temuan, so we have a Temuan religion. We believe every person of Temuan people who pass away, their spirit will go to the forest. Even the name of the tree and name of the person who passed away. So we often have a name every each tree that grow in the jungle and so the jungle is our family. And but the government never government of Malaysia never recognized our cultural heritage. So, and for them uh, is uh, growth, making money, making profit. And they know the indigenous people have a lot of land that, that contain a lot of timber, a lot of wood, a lot of uh, uh, land for them to mine, like gold or uh, uh, tin mine and so on. So they not recognize the indigenous land. That's the most important thing. So land right is the biggest problem in Malaysia where many indigenous people been pushed away from the land so they can uh, control whatever the land is. The problem is another one is Malaysian system is quite uh, alienated from each state. So federal government of Malaysia have no control to the state government of, of, of many state. We have like a 14th state of Malaysia. Every each state have their own control to the land and the forest. So the only way for us to, to save the forest is relying on the community, especially indigenous people who fought, who, who tried best our, our best to protect the land by building blockade, stopping the loggers, stopping the uh, development in our ancestral land, and and this is one example that um, deforestation is still going in the moment. It's a legal deforestation project, still going. Even today, my brother's land was encroached by the state government. And because the, in Malaysia, we have quite a number of uh, politicians who have benefit, who get the share on this company who lock this uh, forest. So they, they go through, through that, so making the indigenous people harder to protect our land. And that create the human and wildlife conflict as well. Because we forgot about biodiversity is include the life who live in the forest. Those life matters. We human, we need wildlife as well. Because without them, we are nothing. Without forests, we are nothing. And that's actually one of the important things in, in, in my religion that we need to respect the, 
the wildlife, because the wildlife is, is our brothers, is our grandfather, our grandmother. It's the same thing in our, our religion as well. Some of our ancestors, our, my, my grandmother, grandfather passed away, their spirit will go to the tiger, the spirit will go to the elephant, to the bear. And those are our, our ancestors. So we often, the conflict started when, when the deforestation going on and the animal, the, if, you, if you learn about indigenous culture, we know where the animal is going to go to find the food. So uh, we often, when, the, the, when, when the, this, uh, those game trails were disturbed, animals go straight to the indigenous uh, area. So, and we, as indigenous people, often have to go toward a street protest to, the, to do demonstration to show, to tell the, the community in Malaysia that um, our work since matters for the, the, the health of our ecosystem in, 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 in Malaysia. And I hope, I hope, we hope our effort will inspire others to respect nature. It's not just that, do the action, protect the nature, and try the best we can to live together and harmoniously. Because life is about balance. We need nature as well to live as a human in this planet. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And uh, we share all these, uh, we have sympathy, sympathize with all these, because uh, the, the indigenous people or those, um, or we can call it minority or those ethnic tribes, actually they are original landowner. They have been there for many long time. And the states or the government or the nation comes came only later. So, and, and the, when we talk about these, uh, the communities, the ethnic communities, culture, means act, originally is associated with nature. So what we different, like a cultural heritage or nat natural heritage, but actually they are intertwined and um, put together. So all of our speakers has shared and ask for, I think we have to be more understanding about these uh, minorities' voices and how important their role in the saving our planet, Earth, and, um, and of course, the sustainability of the future. So uh, maybe my next question for Mataya, it's, uh, it's uh, how that uh, cultural wisdom role in uh, coping with these challenges um, in the protecting heritage. Yeah, the, um, I'm big on having something you haven't tried before, uh, giving that an opportunity to try and remedy what's happened. And it seems like colonization has been the root cause of a lot of our problems. So why not give the indigenous knowledge an opportunity to try and heal the world with indigenous knowledge? Um, obviously the predicament we are in at the moment uh, has been spearheaded by non-indigenous companies and peoples. So uh, I think that it's about time that we gave that opportunity to an indigenous worldview. Why? Because the indigenous people have been there long before the colonizers have. They know the land intrinsically. They know the trees intrinsically. They know um, these uh, mediums a whole lot more than the colonizer does. So I think it's time that we, we give the indigenous that opportunity to try and heal the world that they've come from, the world that they've grown to know. Uh, another thing, uh, based on my PowerPoints, if someone can bring my PowerPoints up. <coughs> Indigenous knowledge and healing the people. We in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have a kapahaka competition. Kapahaka is the traditional dance of the Maori. 
And that's the biggest Māori gathering that happens biannually. This is our opportunity to speak our truth. This is our opportunity to farewell those who have passed away. This is our opportunity to project who we are tribally. This is our opportunity to heal one another. These happen biannually and this is done in the Māori language, first and foremost. Secondly, this is our opportunity culturally to be able to promote who we are as Māori. Outside of that, we have schools or Kura Kaupapa Total Immersion Schools in the Māori language where science is taught in Māori, math, maths is taught in Māori, uh, PE or sports all taught in Māori. These are some of the movements that have helped catapult the revival and the resurgence of the Māori people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Unfortunately, these are poorly funded by the government because the government does not see the value in what these are in these movements or in Te Kura Kaupapa or in Kura Kaupapa um, frameworks. These have all been community-led initiatives. And I think it's important for the government to hear what's happening in their various communities because this happened in 1985 in Auckland, one of the biggest urban settings in New Zealand. And this is where the very first Kura Kaupapa Māori uh, was established and there's over 500 of them in Aotearoa at the moment. So this is a hub where people who are Māori can be proud to be Māori and be unapologetically Māori. Last year, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced the very first Matariki public holiday. Now Matariki is the star cluster that people might, may know as Pleiades, Subaru to some, but Matariki to the Māori people. Now this is the beginning and the end, or this is the full moon phase, new year for the Māori people. And it only took for uh, 183 odd years for the government to realise and value the Māori perspective of the time system. So this is the beginning of the, the end and the beginning of the Māori year, and it was made a public holiday. The person who was responsible for dispersing that knowledge upon the people of Aotearoa and to uh, inform the Prime Minister as well as a good friend of mine, Professor Rangi Matamua. And because our New Year is four days, he asked for the holidays to be for four days, which was not granted. But it shows that New Zealand are, are growing and understanding and wanting to come to the party and being a bit more empathetic to the uh, indigenous peoples of Aotearoa. So we have the schooling system where we can be unapologetically Māori. We have uh, events that happen biennially that um, reinvigorates the people culturally. And then we have uh, a bit of awareness from the, from the greater New Zealand and the government to help with this pursuit of normalising that the Māori people are here validating their knowledge and showing a bit more empathy towards the people that were once frowned upon or once spoken ill of. So on Monday I spoke about um, sustainability from an environmental perspective and I thought today I'd speak about it from a personal perspective and people's, uh, unless I regurgitate what I said on Monday, but I think culture and people go hand in hand. Uh, we say, um, ki te māwiwi te whenua, ka māwiwi te tangata. If the land is not in a good, uh, isn't in good health, nor are its people. So here are some uh, uh, initiatives that have been led by the community to try and help revive the Māori people. Thank you, Mataya. And Lee, what are you doing to uh, create the balance for these challenges in the, you face? He, um, yeah, thanks, Momo. And also, uh, the word colonization is very strong, as Matea mentions. And I believe that it's time for us to decolonize many things, including uh, equality of human being and also uh, the um, equality for biodiversity that Chuck just mentioned about, you know, 
I would like to bring up with one of the words that I learned from my parents. That's, you know, in Akka, we say that, Dossi Patong Burne Mange, Dossi Upu Dene Mapa. It's like, it means that the back of the knowledge is never, uh, you start to use, it will be more knowledge will gain into your back. And Dossi Upu Dene Mapa is more like the bottle of the wisdom. Uh, the more that you share, you will gain more wisdom in your society. Same here, I would like to mention about what I'm doing here back to Thailand and also my hometown is more about how to create the balance of the um, diversity. And it's not only for about the food that I mentioned earlier, but it's also the equality and I gave in the recognitions for the the young of the indigenous people as well. Of course, in this era, we have to study the modern knowledge. But when you look at the wisdom that we um, have been inheriting from our parents and grand family, it's just something that really, really important for us to remember that um, we need to respect for the diversity on this earth. Uh, for example, like uh, I work a lot with the indigenous community to protect the territory for the insects and bees, especially for that um, uh, the bee colony. And we also work slowly, but surely we will grow in our hometown that we want to protect uh, the diversity through our work. Um, my full job is for coffee, but I don't really want to speak much here, but I really pushing my energy into how to protect the diversity of uh, the, the nature system. For example, like we know that the bees is very good pollinator for this earth. And you know that we used to have for more than 20,000 species of bees on this earth. But together that I learned through my participations with the Slow Food Movement, which is I'm a delegate of the, the organization as well, I found that we have only about 400 species of bees left on this earth. That's hurt me a lot. And think about the pollinator like bees. We can't live without bees. Our food will extend within a couple of years without bees. The bees are not only producing the honey for us, but the good to know is that you know, the bees produce about five grams of the honey for their lifetime. And they fly about 15 kilometers per hour to pollinate the whole forest for us. What does it mean to us? It means that the life begins, the life is continue. The food is still remain. I think about the food system that broken today that I said that is colonized by just several a corporate company. Think about that if these insects will disappear. Our children will know only three vegetables in the plates. And I don't think that that's a beautiful world. Even though how much of the cap capital that you have in your pocket, it's not necessary anymore. So the way that we do it is, it's yes, the small organization that I'm running, but I'm pretty sure that this is something that we want to continue to tell our peoples and our generations in today is that we need to work together um, to protect. For example, in Thailand, we really wish that we want to see the seasonal consumptions rather than a base in supermarket. We want to see more vegetable in the plates and they walk. And also, 
you know, under the ocean. We don't want to neglect something that we only see on the surface of the, this earth. But what about the sustainable fishing, the sustainable harvesting? I think this is something that we start from our hands here today. Thank you. Uh, both of the speakers have highlighted uh, to be more emphasized on the people, mm. each and every people, each and every ethnic, and uh, recognize the diversity, not only to the people, but also other <laughs> species in the world, and um, to, to make a more uh, livable for the world because of this colonization or modernization or, or the um, uh, exploitation of resources, those are really threatening and um, not recognizing the safeguarding knowledge is where the local people have. So for Shaq, I know you are artist and uh, we have all these uh, cultural <laughs> advocates with the culture of voices. But another cultural form is a, is a form of the creative artworks. These are very, also very impactful in making aware, uh, raising awareness to the people of how important this. So could you please ex elaborate yeah. us on the role of culture, uh, creative work? <laughs> Uh, can I go back to my slides? Yeah, I'm apart apart being an activist, I'm also artist. But actually, when I uh, been doing art for almost 20, 20 years now, and there's uh, nothing separate. There's no uh, borderline between art and art activism at all. I realize it's, I'm doing the, the same job and then have delivered the same message in my work. And what, what, what I realized how powerful the visual effect I can produce if I create some work. And I realized it's not uh, difficult for me uh, to what's it called? To fight through uh, the 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 medium that I can, I'm familiar with is is artwork. At the same time, I like to uh, to in, in, reintroduce or introduce the the narrative about uh, artwork and also about how how me as an indigenous people. At the same time, how I gonna address it about uh, the importance of nature with human, with indigenous people in, in my work. So I often bring up all the, uh, all the material that I'm familiar with is the, the weaver, I mean, the weaving mat. This is quite common in my culture where my mother is master weaver, my sister is master weaver. I'm, I'm also learning to do weaving as well. And Incorporated together in my work is one of the things I can uh, uh, share about how important is the, the nature to, to the uh, indigenous community because many of many of Malaysian uh, nowadays they live they live day by day on the on the smartphone. Everybody is staring on the smartphone on the screen, and and there's not. Uh, uh, it, this not, uh, the indigenous youth is not excluded. They are part of those uh, uh, lifestyle when they consume the information on the smartphone. Or oh, when I when I uh, putting that I work together with this uh, um, uh, material, I realize many of the young youth of indigenous people uh, they don't uh, they don't uh, uh, realize how beautiful the, 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 the mat is, because the mat is a part of our culture. Every marriage ceremony, we have the moving mat on the floor. So they, they often just step on it, uh, sit on it. 
but when you put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a wall or frame it nicely and they, they find it's, it's beautiful but not just that I putting the message in, in that work so because in the, the, the forest near my village almost been uh, destroyed by this uh, development uh, projects but we managed to stop it one of the, uh, one of the key point that we put in our uh, memorandum to, to stop this project is the importance of our, of our culture to the, with the environment because our, our culture is our environment is part of our culture There's, it's one of the uh, key points that we, 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 we use a lot in our fight to save the environment so what I do I, I, I try to inspire young generation of indigenous people to address the problem about our uh, our environment in Malaysia through my work. At the same time, I can teach young generation of, in, of indigenous people and also young generation of the Malaysian to know how important it is. Not uh, how important it is in environment to the human. It's not just what, whatever you can buy in the small market, but to know where the food came from, like uh, like. The, where is the pernilator come from? It's so where the native uh, home. It's a forest. This is where the, the, the pernilator come from. It's not just bee, but bat, like birds. There's so many de uh, uh, life in the forest that really give us a lot of benefit. The, all the food that you, you enjoy today, they are thanks to this pernilator, thanks to this habitat they live because they need the habitat they need the forest we cannot just of course in the name of development we destroy it's always like that but it's not the only way to develop of course it's quite irony because you develop you need to destroy first that's kind of irony isn't it but this is not only way if you learn the indigenous way they learn the indigenous wisdom. We can live together harmoniously. This is why never seen any indigenous people that destroy the forest, do the logging, do deforestation. No, because we know we we know the spirit who live in the forest. We know the spirit of animal live in the forest. We know the spirit of the forest that we need to respect because that's is actually where we come from. If we destroy it. We are nothing. We are just dust in the tiny dust in the universe or space of nothingness. So we need to be careful. We need to set a good example for our future children. Thank you. Thank you, Shark, uh, for the sharing us with how you are also thinking of your next generation to, to carry on this work. So I, we also... Uh, continue with this question on um, Ataya also because of uh, our next generation maybe in your the, the uh, ethnic tribal also they have they have different future plan or they may have their different aspiration so what do you think the vital tools and the key learnings in the safeguarding the community culture and natural heritage uh, Ataya uh, the, <clears throat> the aspirations of the people lie with the children, regardless of people, tribe, country. And I think it's important to teach our kids that when we speak of colonisation, we also have to speak about our own successes. We have to speak of our heroic achievements just as much as we speak about our demise and our dilemmas. It's important to tell our kids that they are magical people because when they leave the confinements of their homes, they will always be told that they are not worthy, that the indigenous way is not the right way, that being indigenous is to be 
unnatural, to be weird, to be weirdly unique. <laughs> but that is, your uniqueness is your magic. Your difference is what gives you an edge in this world. And unless that is echoed in the confinements of their homes, they will never ever believe it. We have to be an ancestor that they'll be proud of. So what we do while we're alive is important because that echoes through time. So what are some of the tools that will help with the rejuvenation, with the revitalization, with the revival of people is to speak story, is to tell our kids that they are, that they are worthy citizens of the world. It is also to teach them that they are intrinsically infused in the fabric of that land, that they are the land, that they are the skies, that they are the ocean, that they are the forest. Because it takes for stories like that, childhood stories like that for them to continue on the fight that their ancestors fought for, to continue the fight that their ancestors saw. One other thing, take our kids to all our events, regardless of how heated it could get. They need real life experiences of seeing what a champion looks like, of seeing their mother, their father, in the, in the line of fire. Because it's going to take for those real life experiences to motivate them when they feel down. We never ever, from a Māori perspective, we are never on our own. We are never on our own. We walk on the shoulders, we sit on the shoulders of, of giants. They walk with us. They lead us. They guide us. And we have to understand that we are just a glimpse in the timeline of people. And we are taking our children with us, whether we know they are there or not. <laughs> the unborn as well, we are taking our grandchildren with us wherever we go. Uh, I, I think a lot of what we say uh, synonymous um, echoes the perspective of every other individual. Why? It's because our indigeneity binds us. The ocean does not separate us, it connects us. And we are proud to be indigenous and from a, from a young age we are all activists because we have to be. From a Māori perspective we call activists kaitiaki or protectors. All we're doing is protecting what we know is right what we know comes from the same genealogy and what we know to be Māori. Thank you, Mataya. It's also a similar question. Oh, what would you pass on to the next generation, what you have initiated? Thank you, Momo. I think what Mataya mentioned is very important and uh, very similar thought that I have is that we really need to work together and especially with the young people we need to make sure that our generations will not explore more problems for this earth uh, one of the things that I learned from my mom as well that she said mm, you know the earth the forest is not belong to us. Mm. We are belong to the nature. Mm. And I think this is very strong. When I was young, I don't really understand clearly, but I think the more that I gain my knowledge and skills growing up in this uh, civilized uh, global, I found that I need to connect it to many different global citizens including our fellow indigenous peoples. And then I definitely will work more with the team, my people, for them to remember that we have our wisdom that we can share with 
everyone. The resources that we have is not our resources, but that is for entire for living creatures and also natural resources. So we cannot be someone who have to harvest all of the resources at a gone without any dividend for our children. As well as I will work forcefully to, with different obstacles that I have to fight for the future, especially for the climate resilience. And I know that it is something that we are facing really, really hard in the past um, decades that we try to reduce, try to maintain the sustainable planet through our job. And my job is definitely to work with indigenous peoples to make sure that we will follow our wisdom as our ancestors used to protect this earth to maintain the biodiversity as well as the knowledge that our grandparents used to pass to us. In the meanwhile, definitely we have to generate sustainable income as we know that we have to make a living. It's the question that how could we make our career sustainable as well. So I provide the social enterprise to make sure that the team and the people that I work with will harmonize this earth through their career, not just making the private job of our capital. So 40% of our team right now is their background of the indigenous peoples that are working with me. 70% of our working space is a green space, divide for nature. At 100% of our investors in our organizations, they are farmers. So the bones, the force, the energies, everything that they invest to the work that we work together, it will be meaningful today and tomorrow. Thank you. That is perfect. If, if all these uh, private sector or the, uh, the <laughs> communities will do the same, it, it will be the best. And of course, uh, in this session, you all have shared this, uh, out the role of the ethnic communities in safeguarding as a guardian of the, our natural environment. And uh, you all have this vision. And it will be better if all these um, government or policymakers would support this vision. And what would you wish that um, the government would support a policy or the action to these communities or your vision? Uh, please start with Shaq. <coughs> right. Uh it's, I think in the, in the long run, uh, uh, I need to start with the, with the youth, the young generation first. And education is the most important thing, and uh, especially in the indigenous community in Malaysia, because our indigenous community in Malaysia, we are very tiny populations. We only made up 1% out of a the uh, 34 million, so we almost like uh, 2 million indigenous people live in uh, Malaysia, so not much cont contribution. And, uh, but our dropout rate in the school is quite high because of the, the, uh, the we don't have a, a proper infrastructure, we don't have a, a, a water, electricity, uh, even some of indigenous people uh, they live poorly and, and because uh, we be denied because uh, since we so-called uh, against what the government uh, do like the growth of you know everybody need to contribute the growth of our country but since indigenous people are the one who put, try to protect their for forests from being destroyed so we often doesn't get the proper uh, 
help from the government in terms of uh, facility and infrastructure that we, everybody uh, should uh, enjoy and every human being. But Malaysia, the, the human rights case is quite high, especially among the indigenous community because uh, we, 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 we poorly, poorly in uh, what's called infection rates in, in as our maternity rates quite high in many indigenous community and also the, that will affect the education in the young youth. So my, my hope for the, for, the, for the Malaysia government or any, any government or any company who would like to, uh, uh, to have what we do, and so we try the best we can. We do all the best we can, doesn't matter if we don't, if we don't get any help, but we will protect the forest, doesn't matter, because this is part of our duty as uh, indigenous people in the earth. Thank you, Sh uh, Sh So, uh, I think at least uh, whoever decide to do the development in the area, should they have that, um, that kind of practice of uh, consulting with the community or? Yes. I know. Would, it, would it be enough or? Yes, this, that <laughs> proper consultation, proper, uh, you know, empathy and compassion need to be mm. a key in your project. Compassion need to be part of, of your whatever project you're on. Whatever, because that's, we're dealing with human life. We're dealing with life. Mm. In business, compassion needs to be first. I know sometimes you carry, in being carried away and so called, you, you're not going to meet all your, uh, you know, profit that you, you're, you're projecting. And then, but yeah. if you're dealing with the, um, if you want sustainable development or sustainable, you know, growth, you need to consult the community. Yeah. You need to learn the basic of human. That we, our basic as human is nature. That's just our, that's why we become human today. Yes, maybe sometimes consultation just not enough. Actually taking the action or listening to the voices, uh, it's more important. Or sharing the same goal would be the best. So I'm gonna ask the same question to Mataya. So what would more the government or the decision maker should do to achieve your vision? To honour the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, the Treaty or Te Tiriti of Waitangi was signed in 1840. Uh, the first article is about governing people. Second article is about the undisturbed rights to our states. And the third one is about equality. If the government cannot adhere to the principles of what their forefathers signed, then by all means, give me it all back and I'll govern it myself. But because we speak of empathy and compassion, one thing that echoes in New Zealand at the moment is co-governance, is working together the people of New Zealand and the indigenous people. But that's the watered down version of what my heart wants to see. Land back, give me my land back. And I'll know, as I have known, how to manage it. Thank you, Mataya. And how about Lee? Could you, what, what kind of policy uh, decision or action support would you like to have? I, first of all, I truly agree with uh, Chad and Mattel. And for, for us, especially here in Thailand, you know, from my personal perspective, I really hope that the policy of the governance of the government will reduce to promote the mono culture, agriculture. I really hope that the biodiversity of, from the 
integrations or integrated farming will come back together with uh, the full system that I mentioned earlier. That's number one that will create the equality for the food accessibility for all. The second part that I really want to see from our government actions is that to recognize the difference as well as the rights to live on their own land, to make sure that they have the rights to voice, the rights to practice their culture, and as well as to be part of the nature to take care. It's not about to manage, but they are there to take care and give them the rights to be the pride to look after, to be guardian at the, the territory and indigenous land that they belong. Thank you that uh, decision makers or the policy makers should not just go, should not take in them, themselves as to manage, <laughs> but to listen and taking account of all these diverse opinions and um, the lives of people as well as the nature and the species. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, I think the panel's uh, discussion is here, but I would like to invite uh, if any question to these panels and uh, maybe a one or two for the, each panelist and then the, we will sum up uh, after this question and answer. If anyone has a question, uh, our, that, uh, the facilitator will hand you a um, microphone. Any question for? Oh, oh yes. Okay. Um, I have a question for Mattia. Uh, when you say land back, um, oh, I'll stand. Um, hi, I have a question could, for Mattia. Could you could you also uh, describe yourself first? Oh yes. Uh, hi, my name is Amanda. <laughs> um, I have a question for Mattia. I wanted to ask, when you say land back from the government, um, as you imagine it and see it, how would that process happen? And how would non-Indigenous people support that and make that happen? Uh, kia ora. Uh, I think there are two questions in that. How uh, would that happen? Unfortunately, it won't. Uh, I, I think we live in a in a country now where that's near impossible. Despite there being um, a signing or an agreement between the indigenous people and the uh, government at that time, I struggled to see the fragile New Zealander um, return power back to the indigenous people. I doubt they would ever heed the true calling of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. So I think the next best option is co-governance, unfortunately. And we struggle to get that. 50-50 representation of Māori and non-Māori in government, even that's impossible. We've been granted seven seats for those on the Māori uh, electoral role, seven seats in government, seven voices, seven indigenous voices to speak to, to the perspective of the original inhabitants of Aotearoa. So there are systematic, systematical issues happening left, right and centre in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I think even getting the land back to the amount of land that was taken or confiscated is near impossible. Um, 
the buy-in by non-Indigenous, even that'll be near impossible. It, it comes down to having a compassionate heart and to be ethical for us to somewhat have any returns to what was confiscated from my people. We've been fortunate to have some settlements with regards to the confiscation of land, of ocean, of culture and of language. But that does not equate to the level of confiscation that happened. It takes for one generation for the language to be lost and three or four to return. In the five million people in New Zealand, 800,000 are Māori and 20%, 25% of that 800,000 can speak Māori. So there is a big population of Māori in Aotearoa that don't even know their culture. They don't even know their language. They are disconnected from what it means to be Māori. One, one thing that will help tremendously with reclamation of identity is for our land to be back, is to house our people, is to provide work for our people on their ancestral lands, is to educate people, educate Māori on what it means to be Māori. And these, to me, are fundamentals that every Māori deserves to have at birthright. Any more questions from the audience? Oh, there's... Next. Hi, I'm Elisa. Um, my question is, I believe many of us here today grew up in a system that encourages commercialization and the commodification of this world. Um, I would like to know what advice you would have for us moving forward that we can take home and unlearn that and how we can help to honor um, your, your way of living and how we can incorporate that into our way of living and to build better harmony and communicate better. Do you have a particular question to the speaker? Um, if each of you could provide one recommendation that we can learn from you in order to take back and um, apply to our way of living um, so that we can unlearn what we've been taught, uh, which is quite encouraging for profit, um, how we can unlearn that and better honor um, the, the land that we live on as individuals. Thank you, sir. And then, Matya, who would like to start? Yes. Um, if we killed all the cows in New Zealand, <laughs> we still wouldn't solve the pollution issue that the world faces. But I think before thinking on such at such a magnitude is to focus locally on what you can do. Uh, the waterways from where I come from are all polluted. Um, the forests have, uh, have been ransacked by possums. I know I can't solve the population or uh, the pollution on a grand scale but what I do back home in New Zealand, I know is going to be beneficial for my children and my grandchildren. So I think one of the questions, every morning I wake up and look into the mirror, and I think to myself, I look like Aquaman. Outside of that, we must always ask ourselves, is what I'm doing today beneficial for the environment and beneficial for the culture? Thank you, Mataya. That's very... And uh, Lee? Um, 
to me, it's you know, same as Matteo mentions. We start from our um, ourselves here, you know, especially for the consumption. Uh, I think we can we can vote from our rights here. Either you want to consume uh, something, not not just the food, uh, what I mean, but everything that you have to utilize in your life. You can start from looking at a sustainable choice. You look at something that you want from your job that you do. Uh, you want from your capital you have in your pocket. That's what kind of the food or clothes or or logistic that you want to to have. So if we consider from sustainable points of view, I believe that the um, the monopolization uh, system will no longer to take over uh, us. So yeah, I would say you know maybe after these hours when you go to shopping, I think it's a little bit what will make uh, sense to you to spend um, uh, your pocket for the meaningful uh, uh, expenses. Thank you. That's very basic. <laughs> and how about Shark? Would you uh, like to share? Yes, I, I think I agree with uh, uh, Matea. Start with small first. Although you have a big dream, but start with small. Start what what you gonna do today? Like, you know, try tell your friend if you if you see them throw rubbish on the street or something. Tell them and all. Just show show them some good practice, not to pollute. Uh, start small. Uh, if you have children, tell them. You know, if you throw one rubbish, you can imagine if everybody throw rubbish on the street on the river on the oceans the it's like karma those plastic those pollution will back to you in a later life in the form of fish you're gonna eat in the in a, those knowledge need to be shared to our young generation i think start with your family start with yourself and that's that's things you can you can inspire then you get more inspiration based on the act that you're gonna do because it will give you a lot of benefit for your mental health for your physical health itself because you contribute something to you uh, because like I said earlier compassion first how to be start with compassion then we can work and then and that action will ripple to throughout the uh, whatever you're gonna go and that will that good example will followed by the young generation. I think that's what I learned from my mothers and my, my grandmothers because respect is one of the key points in occupation because in, in my culture, in indigenous people, we respect first before we speak, we, before we look, sometimes we can, sometimes those kind of action give you uh, time to think before we move. Uh, this is one of the things, uh, it's, it's a perfect example that you can follow. Think first before you're gonna move. Because those is basic the way we do every day. And I hope you can start small. And yes, of course you can dream big. That's no problem, but start small. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, I am Sherry. My question connects to Matteo, but also goes to three of you. And since Matteo, sorry for my wrong pronunciation, you mentioned that the language. I'd like to know uh, what's your idea in the colonizing in terms of language. I mean, we are now here communicating in the same language, right? But I, it's not my native 
language, and I think uh, some of us have our own maybe dialects. But uh, nowadays, even my my nephew, he he, he cannot speak dialect, but only official language. So I mean, in this kind of context, how 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 would you or how can we bring the language environment back? And uh, yes, so that's my question. Thank could you. you. Could you also please de describe yourself? Uh, yeah. uh, you mean my background? Yes. Your your name in. Yeah. Uh, Sherry. You can oh, call me Sherry. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, to the three people who have uh, aimed their questions directly at me, despite there being three panelists, thank you very much. Um, at the end of the day, for me, it's about communication. My thoughts to language is a, a vessel for my thoughts to make it from my mind to yours. So if it's the uh, generic Māori that's spoken. For me, it's like the carving of a canoe. Firstly, you, the, you have to fell the tree. And I think that's the generic language. And then the little intricate aspects of that canoe, those are dialects. The Māori language, there's a generic Māori language and that's used in the various ministry departments purely for communication. But once you make it outside of those spaces, dialects are a hint of where you're from. If you do not pronounce the W in the fa words for Māori, I know you're from the North Island. If you do not pronounce the H, I know you're from the West. If you drop the G and from Tangata to Tanata, I know you, you are from the Tuhoi tribe. But those are um, initiatives that should be spearheaded by those communities and supported by Greater Māori because that's what gives us character. That's what gives our language personality, are our dialects. But as I said at the outset, it's important for people to communicate. 80% of the Māori vocab is shared between all tribes. The 20% is your tribal nuances that make you tribal, that make you from your designated area. I think we are still in a position of revival and we're transitioning into a position of normalisation and that's to normalise the use of the Māori language on various platforms and to be heard throughout uh, Greater New Zealand. I think in about 10 years time we can give more emphasis to dialect but I think we have to fell that tree first. Uh, well, to me, it's happening in my community as well that, you know, the young people, uh, they start to kind of losing their, their language, especially indigenous community here. Very often they don't want to, uh, either they don't feel confident to speak native language because when they go going to the bigger society, like in our urban community, they feel um, not secure or unsecure because it's um, still in the in the in a feeling where people are looking down uh, with the differences. So I think to to learn about the language. Uh, the the benefit is there definitely you know you know you know culture you will know uh, the roots of the family but more important is for
for the society like us here to give the equality, the rights for people to speak up their language, you know, cheer up for them, smile to them, you know, tell them to speak the dialect and the language, you know, tell them how beautiful of their language, you know, rather than laughing at them or, you know, make them feel insecure to speak their language or dialect. So if we can do this, I'm sure that the diversity of the language will still remain, you know, in your family or even to my nephew and niece, this day I speak Aka language to them. Even though in the school time they speak Thai and, um, and you know, English in the school, but at home I'm still talking to them in Aka. So it means, you know, to to, to share the culture, not just the way to con communicate, you know. So I think this is important part that we will value our culture as well at the same yes, time. Yes, yes, of course. And Shark, you want to add? Or on? Uh, yes, I think and, uh, in my uh, language also we start disappearing because it's because of the, our school system doesn't even allow the language spoken in the school. And it's not, not, nothing in the school material that really promote indigenous people at all. And sometimes, not sometimes, I mean, almost all the time in the school today, there's no such word for indigenous people that been presented in Malaysian history. That's one of a big hole that we live today in Malaysia. I think so one thing I've been trying to um, recognize that problem by, you know, working with many researchers in the many authors out there in Malaysia. We try to include all this uh, diversity of languages and um, I'm fortunate enough to help many of the researchers together because Malaysian contain more than hundreds of languages still spoken, but we realize the young generation they don't practice this uh, native language anymore because the school, most of the indigenous people or many in, uh, community live rural. They often put uh, put their children in a boarding school where the the they have the boarding school where the school is the where they use the national language or Mal Malaysian language is spoken first and they don't allow the indigenous to, to speak and often many of the indigenous people come from many different tribes they cannot speak uh, themselves if they speak their own native language they don't understand the reason for, for, uh, does happen because it's, it's a part of their communication but and that practice become one of a problem in, in, in many of our languages disappearing in Malaysia. I think one thing we, we can do today, try to use the, the, the technology that we have today, for example, the smartphone. Um, that's a lot of the young generation now. It's, it's funny enough, my small niece, about five years old, already got a smartphone, right? So, and it's kind of hard to take it away now. I feel like, you know, I feel like they lost something, but we try. I we, uh, we doing we we totally try to create um, apps that can they can translate all the content they have to the native languages by uh, dub all the animation into the native language as well. So I hope this work can be done because we're dealing with uh, more than hundred languages. <laughs> that's quite a daunting task. But start with that. I think I hope soon we will launch something, you know, for young generation to know, at least to listen to the sound of their native language. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, all the uh, speakers. Of course, the language will make you more understanding each other, especially for those uh, indigenous um, native people who knows only one um, mother tongue language. 
So uh, now it's 5.30 and uh, we will be going to close. And before we close, I would like to ask all the panelists um, the message you want to deliver here, especially that uh, because of this, this event, it's uh, quite a big for the benefit of this, um, the organizer. So the message you would like to convey to the audience and the, and the wider uh, the world. <laughs> uh, maybe the Can we start on that side? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Can we start with Lee? Can we start on that side? Oh, me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sure. I think uh, the message, I think I said earlier, but a more emphasize, emphasize. Uh, emphasize okay. with the, the message okay. will go through to the audience and the wider, the online audience mind. What would you like to convey? Yeah. yeah. I think one of the important thing is giving a platform for uh, minority people like me, like we are today, is the platform like this is one of the uh, big step you can start with give you a safe space for us to mm. express our thought, express our wisdom, and also share you about what we learned and what we uh, practice in, in the small community. Because the story matters, doesn't matter how, how small it is, but the platform also give us some, uh, something to breathe, something to you know, uh, enjoy and also uh, celebrate together because uh, we live in a very you know, diverse background and, and to have a platform like this I think it gives uh, hope to uh, small minority people back home in my hometown, give them hope that they are contribute something to the society, they are matters to live because those hopes is become <clears throat> start diminishing for, for 10 years, 5 years because we're dealing with so many conflicts in Malaysia at the moment where many of our Indian people um, lose hope because they lose the, the connection to the land because the land been taken away from them falsely, even they've been murdered because uh, so many is, you know, pro projects been done, they're using the harsh full way to try to taking the land away by giving the platform like this, I think give them hope that that they, their voice been heard and we're not alone in, in fighting to save the forest and also give them the hope that our wisdom is, can be listened by everybody and I hope people can learn something from our wisdom, for indigenous wisdom. Excellent. Thank you. And Lee. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming uh, to, to meet us here today. Uh, indigenous peoples are like your garden. You don't want to grow only one flower to be beautiful garden. You want to grow many, many different vegetations. So please appreciate the difference of the people, not just the flowers. Also, maybe start from today or from now, whatever your career, whatever your occupation is, doesn't matter. You can recognize, you can accept the difference, not only about the indigenousness, but the difference of the people in our society. You know, there are many different kinds of identity behind that. So respect them, recognize them, and cheer or celebrate the difference. Also, when you start to buy or start to eat, the food. Think about if your food and your plates 
will make any different from yesterday and today that you want to make a meaningful for for the nature so I think this is maybe several points of the message that I want to give to all of you here today thank you uh, I'd just like to uh, thank those of you who uh, put on such a great event uh, to all the hours invested into such an event uh, inviting uh, your guests uh, investing into your people uh, the organisers ambassador uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, today somewhere 15 hours away from home heard about my home I was given a platform today where my voice can be heard where the issues my people face can be heard where indigenous knowledge is valued thank you one and all for the opportunity to bring my people, my culture, my language here to Thailand our job now is to take up arms and to continue what we've spoken about today otherwise they're cheap words and this is just lip service we need manpower we need support we need compassion we need empathy we need love we need understanding education and I think with all those combined I think we will finally see a world that we wish we saw but a world that will be lived by our children and our grandchildren if you think about your time that your scope is too short it's about what we do now for a better tomorrow thank you very much Thank you, and uh, thank you, of course, Mataya, Lee, and Shah for the insightful and inspiring presentation. And with this, uh, we come to an end. And I, we, of course, I think the audience will agree that we have learned quite a lot today. And uh, in order to repeat what uh, speakers have said, we have to think of what we do every day and uh, what we do every day defines our culture and uh, our culture we should not forget our nature natural environment and um, so that uh, we are prepared and of course uh, whoever uh, we our speakers today are of course uh, the uh, representing the ethnic communities but wherever we live in we live in the cities or in the countryside we've got to we've got to uh, uh, to be prepared with that and also of course uh, we have shared a lot of that uh, uh, the, the thoughts in the, from the these uh, minority voices who actually are been uh, guardian to uh, the nature as, uh, associated with nature and uh, we, we really have to hear their voices and uh, please stay tuned for the follow us uh, Sam Society and the uh, Royal Patronage and Seacher through our website and the social media as seen on the screen I expect the, our uh, website and uh, social media page on the screen and we also have the mini ex exhibition on our newly published books, book on the cultural wisdom for climate action, learning from Southeast Asia and the cultural heritage zone, G flow in front of all four in this event. Uh, this is the output of our previous conference in January this year. 
one of our in-kind sponsor was Thai Beverage, and thank you again for the support. And I would like to inform that that book that we has just we have just published, uh, the cover painting has been our <laughs> our uh, honorary artist here. <laughs> so you can see his um, his very very um, talented artwork in the in the cover, and. Um, finally, thanks to Essex 2023 and all participants and online audiences. And we hope to see you again next month in the November chart time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to Kun Momorwin and all of our speakers. For now, I'd like to invite all of you to have a group photo together. Could you please kindly step down as our photographer will come in front of the stage to take photos of all of you. And thank you so much. And those are the efforts to maintain their cultural identity and local wisdom and natural heritage. Thank you so much for all of you. So let me inform you that while taking this picture, you can download our application, Sustainability Expo. Once you download our application, you can scan this QR code. They will be show up on the stage soon. Once you scan the QR, the QR code, you can collect some points and those points you can redeem special prices at our booth on G floor and LG floor. Thank you very much. Another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for the XS 2023.